Putting the Pieces Together with Jigsaw Learning focuses on stories from the field as leaders implement collaborative response. Join us every month as we invite our partners to share how they are meeting the diverse needs of students with the integral understanding that every child deserves a team. Welcome back to another episode of Putting the Pieces Together with Jigsaw Learning. Curtis, Lorna, and I are joined today by Rob Champ, who has an interesting background that we are going to get him to share a little bit about. He comes to us from Calgary Board of Education uh, at the Ernest Manning High School. So hi, Rob. It's nice to meet you. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Hey, Rob. Hi, great Rob. to it's have you great here. to have you join hey, us. So before we get into the educator side of things, Rob, you are involved in rugby. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. <laughs> um, so I'm the senior boys coach here at Ernest Manning for our rugby program. Absolutely fantastic program to be a part of. Um, you know, the season just wrapped up for us. So uh, we didn't get as far as we wanted to go, which is very unfortunate, but um, altogether like a, a very successful season as well. Uh, a little bit about Ernest Manning Rugby. This is our second year at the Div 1 level for senior boys. We had some great success last year going all the way to Provincials, um, doing very well there, getting silver, and then building up can, with that momentum uh, this year as well. That's so it's, exciting. It's a great, great spring sport. It's a, totally the highlight of my school year is, is coaching rugby. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So yeah. I would assume that you're a player as well? I'm not. I just, I have a love <laughs> and a passion for the game. Um, when I was in university, my my wife, girlfriend at the time, um, we took a semester off and went to New Zealand for four months and uh, just the rugby culture down there, it's everywhere. So, um, fell in love with it in my early twenties and, and it's just been a passion ever since. So, yeah. It's so funny uh, that you mentioned the New Zealand, uh, we've had the opportunity to spend some time there too. And we can attest to the rugby culture. I actually just bought a book on our last trip, um, that we were on just this last weekend that uh, the title of the book was Legacy, but it was all about the New Zealand All Blacks yeah. uh, team and the leadership les lessons oh, that yeah. you learn. So I'm uh, I'm going to dig into that in the summer. But super fascinating that again, yeah. that culture. Yes, uh, rugby in like for Cal Calgary high school sports, so the CBE and the Catholic Division. Um, in my opinion, it's it's one of those last grassroots sports, right? Every yeah. um, every student has a place on the team. Um, you know, if, you know, even our badminton team at Ernest Banning is highly competitive, and they cut people from that team, uh, wow. which is great. Like it's everything, right? So yeah. um, I think really like girls rugby, boys rugby, um, probably girls field hockey, right? Those are kind of the last sports uh, where you don't need that club experience. Everybody can come, join, and play. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, that's very cool. Well, hey, Rob, um, just for our audience, can you share a little bit about the context of Ernest Manning High School, just so that everybody gets a sense of uh, the setting that you are working in? Yeah, so Ernest Manning High School, uh, we're in Southwest Calgary. Uh, it is a fairly new facility. I think this is year 12 or year 13 for the building. We, we, uh, we lost the old facility with the LRT expansion in Calgary. So the, the whole school was kind of just shifted. Um, it's kind of serving the general of the same communities, um, but it was, it was definitely a transformation in, in terms of the, the quality, well, not known, um, transformation totally of the school culture and kind of the, the atmosphere around the building. Uh, when they when they moved uh, facility locations, we have about 1,500 students, uh, which is which is nice. Like we're 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 almost at capacity. Uh, we have had close to 1,900 students in this building, so it has wow. been a very very busy place uh, for some years. And now we're we're getting that balance around 1,500, which, which feels good. Yeah. And there goes the and that's how There's we know we're in this building now. <laughs> So Rob, talk to me. Obviously, we want to dig into the school's experience around collaborative response, but maybe just give a little bit of how this came to you and your involvement in the school. Just a little bit of the history of the collaborative response work that's there and, and your role within it. And then we want to dig just a little bit into what the works look like out at your school. For sure. Um, last year, uh, some of the learning leaders of our core academic classes participated in some collaborative response um, kind of pre-planning. Um, that work was done kind of just for select teachers who wanted to be part of that. 
uh, and they were kind of just working with it with the with our principal and area director. Uh, this year, that shifted. We have a um, kind of it was a complete staff uh, in involvement with collaborative response. Mm -hmm. um, so, like we we had that in person meeting uh, at the beginning of the year. I think in early October, uh, yeah, we came right. down, um, and I was part of that. Um, so it's you know it, that was my first real interaction with with collaborative response, uh, and I thought it was just like fantastic. So just I was something I was going to implement just in my own little culinary arts department, and it was great. And then after that, I was I was asked just if I wanted to to kind of just take the lead and kind of implement it uh, throughout our school. Uh, so we started a, a CTM committee, and uh, four or five other teachers and learning leaders joined in, and we've been kind of just rolling with it ever since then. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that because we often hear of schools that set up, you know, we've heard it called their guiding coalition or lead their team. their lead team, uh, that leadership team. Maybe describe for us a little bit of who's on that team and what the role has been as you've, like you said, you've introduced and now implemented across the entire staff body, which is, yeah, fairly expansive it's and not, task. yeah, it's not that it can follow yes, yeah, one person. Yeah. Yeah, so a, a few staff members uh, from last year who were part of the, the collaborative response group uh, continued on with with me this this year, uh, and I just threw a, I just threw an email out. Is anybody interested in in rolling out collaborative response in our school? And and we had some other learning leaders who were not part of it uh, last year kind of just jump right in. We have representation of I think every department in the building, and, or or if not, like we're in contact with those learning leaders and and in those department staff. Um, but it, basically, we were we were meeting kind of every two to three weeks, um, at, starting in October, uh, just kind of getting all that 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 groundwork done, um, making sure we were nice and organized, right? Because we want to make sure that you know if there's if we're implementing kind of um, actions for you know 70 staff members we don't we want it to be done properly so yeah of course a lot of that that front loading that front heavy work and then and then we rolled it right out how did you introduce because i know that within Ernest manning the the entry point for bringing in your staff was just let's start having these collaborative team meetings uh component how did you introduce that to the staff team and get the first iterations rolling within the school. We had a staff meeting in late October uh, where we kind of went over the, the key points of, of collaborative response and these collaborative team meetings um, with just general like here's kind of here's what we're looking to achieve for this school year. Uh, we gave them a quick little demo, like a little mock CTM um, yeah. with, our little, with our little CTM committee. Um, and then I think it was like a week and a half later, it was all right, let's go. Um, and it's just, you know, we, we had the learning leaders be the facilitators for the first two meetings. Uh, and we were just doing them once a month. Um, got feedback right away. We had a little debriefs with our admin kind of at the end of each of those initial CTMs. Uh, and it was just kind of just more organizing after that. And so... Um... Is the intention then that those collaborative team meetings are happening on pretty much a monthly basis for you, Rob? So that's interesting. We, we started once a month uh, and we had like our first CTM was in November and then we debriefed. We had another CTM in December and we quickly found that we, you know, it's, it's this, this highly structured team environment that they're in is, is brand new for them. Um, and the feedback they were getting, right, people were just very confused and not quite sure what the kind of the, you know, what, what we're doing, what, you know, how is this different than, you know, something I just do in the hallway with my colleagues and, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. at the end of the day. Um, so we actually went to twice a month. So we were doing during our prep times during the day. Uh, once a month, and then just a whole uh, Friday afternoons as well, once a month. So it was kind of every every two to three weeks we were doing CTMs, um, and that continued all the way up until May. And when you configure those teams in your school, Rob, how do you uh, do that? Because I know that uh, in conversations with different members of your team, it's not necessarily department based. That you're really intentional on. Yep who's going to be part of these teams, knowing that a school your size, there's has to be multiple teams mm -hmm. interacting. Uh, so it was just a, initially done on prep times, right? Who was available to meet with who during the day. Right. Uh, and then looking at what courses those folks teach. Um, we actually kind of just, our CTM committee was like, all right, this, you know, um, we need, you know, equal representation of math. So we kind of really drafted up these, these collaborative team meetings uh, so that all kind of disciplines in, in the school were, were connecting with each other. Um, we have, we have quite a few staff that are, they're working like 
full full time, so they don't have a prep. Uh, we also have some part time staff. So we found that um, switching to the afternoons once a month allowed for them to participate in these meetings as well, um, which is good because they were actually craving, you know, that collaborative piece um, and wanting to share and connect with their colleagues. So it was great that we could connect with them at least once a month. Like high school is typically something that that the context is often one of the for seen as barriers, trying to get the right people at the table, right? And I mean, we're here, we're talking to a culinary arts teacher who is part of Skills Alberta at the provincial level, who is a learning leader within the school and talking about teams. So I guess my question is like, how many teams do you have and how many people are part of those teams? There are too many to count, really. We've got <laughs> committees for everything. Like there's a tech committee, a PD committee, we got the collaborative response committee. Um, you know, that's just kind of school-wide stuff. You know, you have your 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 disciplinary departments, numerous clubs and activities like this. The school is a very, very busy place. So um, just yeah, a myriad of, of actual teams that are in the building. So um, collaborative, you know, our, our collaborative team meetings, though, is definitely something that is brings everybody together, you know, because we it, often kind of, we've been, we're coming out of a place of, of isolation at the school, um, you know, COVID and then, you know, at the high school level for sure, um, you know, our restrictions were just eased up last, last year around early May. Uh, so it's only really been 12 months that we've had kind of going back into a regular high school kind of atmosphere and culture. Um, so like the school has been a very, very busy place um, this school year, which is, which is fantastic. Like we, we bounced back real quick from that. Um, but there was nothing really kind of bringing everybody together besides just general staff meetings. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice. It's nice to have kind of this, this one team that kind of connects all of them together. So, so Rob, I, it's really exciting to be able to hear the number of collaborative team meetings you've got going on and that you've got those multi multidisciplinary um teams together. So you've got lots and lots of different people with lots of different ideas that are coming together. What what would you say is the greatest impact that you have seen because of those those teams? Um, community is definitely the the, the big takeaway for our staff uh, this year from from collaborative response. Um, you know, we we've people have been just shut inside their classrooms for two or three years. Um, you know, it was it was a very uh, we were encouraged. You know, if you're if you're on your prep, just just leave early, right? You don't want to be in the building. Um, so it's, you know, coming to place, you know, this is a place where we, you know, this, we're here in person, we're working, we're putting in the hours, we're, we're putting in that work to support our students. Um, and it, it did not take long for, for people to, to use these bi-monthly meetings as a way to re reconnect with each other after such a long time. In a larger high school as well, it's not uncommon uh, to be working with other individuals for years and to talk to them maybe, maybe just a handful of times in that time. So having these interdisciplinary meetings that we had uh, really allowed us to meet our colleagues that we, who we've been working with for, for years now as well. Well, and I know with that too, is it there's a difference between just meeting and connecting, but when you start to share, you know, some of the common concerns that we're experiencing and then people opening up their toolbox, that just leads to a different level of vulnerability and connection that staff members who may not have interacted, well, maybe personally, but maybe not professionally now have that opportunity. Yeah, we have um, like one staff member was sharing a story where uh, they have barely talked to this one individual for the last four or five years. Uh, they were in the same CTM. Uh, and now, um, you know, this person who was typically very, very secluded and very quiet uh, is now openly kind of interacting with other staff members in the building. And, you know, it's just, you know, they're building that, that sense of community um, again, you know, whereas they normally they would just walk by each other in the hallway and just maybe a head nod. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. Well, you know, the one thing that I would love for you to share with uh, anyone that's viewing or listening to this is what your lead team started to do as artifacts following the collaborative team meetings. I had a chance to see one of the tier two strategy collections that went out and absolutely loved it. Do you want to just speak to that being able to share, knowing there's multiple teams talking and how do you communicate everything that's going on so that people get a sense that even though I wasn't in this conversation over here, there's something I can gain from that. Can you talk about the, the artifact that's been 
sharing amongst the whole staff community? Yeah, so uh, like in our first couple of CTMs, we we decided, you know, we were have this central focus area that all of the groups would would discuss, um, and we we split the staff into kind of two groups per prep period. Uh, so there was eight CTMs happening kind of during that that CTM day. Um, so it's a lot of meetings, right? And there's there's meeting notes. Um, we, we consolidated kind of the the notes and agendas from those eight. Uh, groups for those first two months. Uh, and then one of our learning leaders kind of developed a newsletter uh, looking at the, the common strategies and supports uh, that were suggested. And then we share that with the staff. And uh, that's actually, it's the newsletter, his newsletter that actually got a lot of our kind of, a, I don't want to say reluctant, but less energetic yeah. staff yeah. members <laughs> are like, oh, wow, like, I, yeah, like, that's, that's fantastic. Like, I, that, 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 that's great. Like, this is, this is what it's all about. Um, so it was that physical piece for them um, that really brought them on board uh, following that. We found, though, that it was, it was qu quite difficult to give it that central focus area for the, you know, mm -hmm. the 70 or so staff members because um, it just it did not resonate with some of them. Uh, so in our coming back after winter break, we met in early February and it was like, all right, here's the new collaborative team meeting groups for the semester. Um, and this was like a, this was a, like, we're definitely doing this in September and, and the following semester, it was like a, just a breaking bread kind of meeting, right? Where like, let's actually introduce each other, um, share a little bit of the, the subjects that we teach. Cause we, or for many of us, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was just an idea generating, like what issues did you have last semester or in the previous year that you feel would be worthy of, of collaborating with other colleagues about? Uh, mm -hmm. So we got a whole list of, of focus area ideas and, and it, we, we sent that out to everybody um, in the different groups. And as all right, you guys are just kind of hit the ground running and you're, you're gonna choose your own focus areas now. Um, so we couldn't do the monthly newsletters as part of that because they were just the groups were all over the place in terms of talking mm -hmm. about focus areas that were relevant to them. Uh, so we did this big um, kind of semester two kind of analysis of the, the meeting notes for all of these eight groups for twice a month for four months. Uh, and that same learning leader spent like a, a whole week and a half just looking at those common focus areas and the common strategies and putting that all together. Yeah, when I saw the that newsletter or a version of it, I thought, man, that's just a powerful representation of the exceptional expertise that you would have collectively across the building mm -hmm. with that many staff, right? You know, it, it's it's mentioned in in the reading, right? Um, that this is something that really raises the professional capital of the of the building yeah. higher, right? Um, and like the human capital at Ernest Manning is just like the highest of quality, right? We have some some absolutely tremendous teachers. Uh, like everybody on staff is just uh, just a, a fantastic teacher. They know what they're doing. Um, so it was building that you know that collaborative piece, that that almost that social capital. Uh, to bring us all together now is is really has been the kind of the shift in terms of uh, kind of staff culture this year. Um, so yeah, it's great to see that we can just you know give people these these tasks and these items and they just roll with it and they're just giving us such an amazing results. Awesome. And when you think about the you know the like you were talking about the expertise that you already have in your building, but now even continuing to build that further by sharing across disciplines too, that's really exciting. Rob, when you talk about some of those cultural shifts, knowing that you've been at this well, for the better part of a year, what have been some of the shifts that you've you've seen as a result of of the work that you've been deeply and passionately engaged in? We're we're becoming a a staff culture uh, of of I don't know, like a high quality of trust again, right? Mm. You know, being being alone and. And kind of uncertain for the last few years, right? Um, so, you know, still doing a, you know, still working every day, working with our students, but supporting yep. our students. Uh, maybe that, you know, that, but that collaboration piece was not there. Uh, it's definitely becoming that, that high trust environment that it, that it used to be kind of before everything kind of changed, which is, which is good. We're avoiding, you know, there's always pockets of collaboration, right? Departments are always working very, very hard with the, with the, themselves. Um, but, you know, it's just, it was very just group based. Right. And mm -hmm. you, you really have no idea what's going on in, in the rest of the building. And, and which is unfortunate, right, because we're all teaching the same kids. So we're really not going we're, we're not aware of the, you know, the challenges and struggles that they're, they're facing um, in, in another area of the school. 
Um, so it's just, you know, the, the, being able to, to meet with each other in, in an environment where you're not going to be questioned on your, your practice um, or your particular kind of viewpoints um, in, in a classroom setting, right, was just absolutely good to see. So, yeah, that's really been kind of that. And, 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 and seeing that kind of in the moment, right? There's, you know, there, you know, a little hesitation in the beginning of the year, um, but you know, you know, we're here to support each other, and you're not being evaluated, right? That's not what this is about being about. Um, and they just kind of they they bought him real quick after that. Rob, I've heard that you've been doing a little bit of work around, or maybe it's a lot of work, <laughs> around your continuum of supports. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's one thing that uh, we've been kind of just building upon uh, this second semester. Um, you know, we, in that February meeting where we were just kind of getting to know each other is, all right, here's, here's some of the tier one supports that we have shared uh, since September. Um, let's, let's go through them, right? And it was just kind of, just, just in case anybody is unaware of any of these kind of these strategies, um, you know, we had that time dedicated. And here's kind of the tier two supports that we already use at Ernest Manning. Um, so, you know, it's just giving, giving folks just time and space to, to go through those and to talk about them and to question them and that, that really just kind of got into the, into the background of the stuff that we're doing on a day to day basis. And then with this, uh, like this infographic that we have kind of at the end of this semester, uh, here's what has been shared based off of these focus areas that everybody has been talking about. So we're kind of just now just honing those tier two supports in. One of our next steps is is really implementing those tier one and tier two supports, kind of every like just having it printed on the table, ready to discuss and refer to in our collaborative team meetings for next year. Um, and then we're going to just refine them, refine them even more, and and then start implementing kind of uh, resources and embedding those into kind of like a digital digital format uh, that people can reference throughout, throughout their, their year. Yeah, that's awesome. The uh, The power of building that continuum is actually not that end result or, or the, you know, the placemat or the digital form that you create, but, but in the, in the conversations, and I love that you said, you know, you actually are engaging in questioning and uh, digging into that deeper understanding of what we have said is tier one and is tier two, but yeah. it is about those conversations, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, we're using a system-based uh, continuum of supports, uh, but it's by no means kind of exhaustive um, of, of the things that we're already doing, right? So it's it's good to be able to to reference this, this standard of continuum of supports that we have um, with the CBE uh, and then just build on it even further, right? Part of our conversations in our kind of staff department meetings uh, a week ago, uh, whereas, you know, many of these are elementary school focused or middle school focused, but they can, we can adapt to them and, and apply them in, in a high school setting. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, we don't have to just, you know, write them off. We can, we can just, we can change them and make them fit for us. Which is Yeah. What does it look like in, in high school? Yeah. I, the, the high school teacher in me is completely in awe. Um, I, like, I'm just, I'm just going back to, to my days of, you know, I mean, my context was a little bit different. I did small school K through 12. I was, I was the math teacher and the science teacher for junior high and senior high. So that, that ability, like when I hear you talk about collaboration and whatnot, I, I came from a big high school. I graduated in Edmonton and my graduating class was a thousand kids. Wow. So yeah. trying to, so I'm, I'm now envisioning all the, the great things that could have happened when, when I was a student. Right. <laughs> so I have always said that CTS teachers get it. That idea of collaboration and thinking outside the box and and it's very evident um, the way you talk so passionately about the process and the building of the trust. So I I love it. But I'm gonna put you on the spot here with a question that we ask all of our participants. This question is brought to you by WeCollab. Designed by educators for educators, this comprehensive digital system aligns with the foundational components of collaborative response. Moving from conversation to action, WeCollab empowers classrooms, schools, and systems to provide the very best response for each and every child by informing action-based decision-making with data and evidence supporting student success. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back, what advice would you give yourself in relation to this work? With that, um, it would have been just, just, just go, just start with yeah. that. Now, like we, our CTM community, like we were working 
it was like every two weeks we were meeting for an hour and a half, um, getting that organizational piece going. Uh, and you know, and we're you know we're referencing this all the all along the way. Um, mm -hmm. And it's that ready, fire, aim mentality. And knowing now, uh, I would just like let's just start firing, and and we'll start aiming a little bit later, because um, that's what we that's what we did, right? We just we we jumped into it. Um, we fired a few times and okay, we gotta we gotta aim and and direct our focus a little bit a little bit tighter in these areas, um, and then it really just like it was it, it worked out really well for second semester. Um, so uh, yeah, no, yeah, I think we would just jump into it automatically in late September, early October, and and just involve mm -hmm. everybody. And um, we were acknowledging that messy side of of this collaborative structure, and you know, it's like yeah, here here's what here's what it is. Um, doesn't have to be like this, you know, for our school community, but we're going to make it our own and, and let's just go. So, yeah, I think we, we could have, uh, we could have, you know, had a, a, a good, um, we would have had a better amount of collaboration second semester, I think, if we just hit, hit it, hit the ground running. So you were talking before about some potential next steps in your mind, Rob, what do you see as where Ernest Manning goes as you lead into planning into next year? Are there any shifts that you're, you and the lead team are envisioning to just continue to evolve and deepen the work. Uh, so we've seen through these focus areas with our CTMs this year um, that a big part of it is wellness based, right? The, 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 the challenges that our students are, are having, um, it doesn't really come from, you know, a, a lack of understanding in, in their subject areas or, um, you know, a, you know, a behavioral issues or something like that, uh, but it is wellness based by nature. So um, a, a big part of our school development plan for next year is going to be on wellness. That's, we've got, I, I believe it's two kind of main focus areas. We have mastery of learning uh, and wellness and the collaborative response is going to be a, a big part of that wellness piece, uh, working with our, our resource department, um, just kind of supporting, supporting students through them uh, and then supporting staff through the CTM piece as well. So, Rob, I do have one more question to be able to pose before Jen kind of leads into uh, wrapping this up. I know your administration has been very diligent in saying this is a priority, but we're going to lean upon distributing that leadership. And you've, you've spoken to that. What advice would you give um, administrators around this work that from in another school, let's say that you think would be valuable to understand when trying to introduce or, or lead this work? As, as I know, your principal is passionate about it, but has also in some ways let go of the reins to the key people on the ground doing that. So what advice would you give to other leaders? Um, yeah, just like what, what our principal Zenny has is, is been so supportive of, of all the staff members uh, throughout the school year. Uh, I think for advice for schools wanting to implement kind of a collaborative response model is to just, just put it out there. Um, you know, teachers want to collaborate with each other. That's a huge part of our profession. They, they want, they, there will be people in every school um, that will that put in that extra work so that they are the, the culture of, of work that they have um, is a very one, a very positive one, one of trust, one of building, you know, you know, nobody wants to be isolated. So I think, you know, just putting out there and supporting them with whatever they need as they need it is, is all they really need to do. Uh, so, you know, it comes down to that, that ready, fire, aim thing again, too, right? Just, just, just go with it. And, and, and the pieces will fall into place, I think. So I'm going to ask one more question before we let you go, Rob. If someone who has not experienced collaborative response were to come to you and say, okay, what is collaborative response? And how is it different than what we already do? How would you answer them? I would probably say that it is a, it's a highly structured way of doing something that you're already doing. Um, but it, it's, it's equitable. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a space where you can connect with others in a, in a kind of a, a risk-free environment. Um, really just there to ensure that it's the, it's there to support students. Well, Rob, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I have, like I said, I'm, I'm in awe. I'm, like I said, high school is typically one of the, the places where it's always the, how do we get the right people at the table to have the conversations and to to hear about this experience in such a large high school with so many people and so many meetings taking place at the same time and hearing how your committee has brought things back together for the entire staff is inspiring. 
So thank you so much for taking the time to share this story today. And thank you, Curtis and Lorna, for bringing one more amazing example uh, of how important context is to the implementation of collaborative response. And Rob, I know you're also uh, a spokesperson for a very dedicated team. So that thanks goes out yeah. to your colleagues that uh, are not necessarily on camera or in the audio, but have been hugely a part of working um, alongside and with you for this work. So kudos out to them as well. Yeah, congratulations. Oh, thank you. That is so awesome. And I want to come for a visit now. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so Rob, before we say goodbye, you've got a captive audience here. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Skills Alberta, I know I went back and said that you're involved with Skills Alberta the, in the culinary arts. Um, do you want to share a little bit about Skills Alberta and uh, why why this is exciting? <laughs> Absolutely. So um, Skills Alberta is a trades technology uh, competition uh, for high school students and post-secondary students. We have at Ernest Manning, uh, we had a team of 22 students competing, I believe, in 17 different uh, trades technologies uh, areas uh, this year. We have regional and qualifying competitions that are based all around Alberta. A uh, big one is is Calgary and Edmonton, uh, and then if you qualify, your your meeting the student is going to Edmonton for the provincial competition uh, every May. Um, it, it's one way that we really celebrate our students in our CTS department here at Earth Spanning. Something that we're we're all very very passionate about in our department. Uh, myself, I'm part of the provincial technical technical committee uh, for the culinary arts side. So I we meet a couple couple times a year with the uh, instructors from SAIT and NATE and high schools across the province and kind of design this this provincial competition. Um, Kind of sending the best the best candidate for for Team Alberta, uh, sending them off to, to nationals um, at the end of every May as well. So you know it, it's absolutely a fantastic. It's another collaborative piece, right? You know, as a CTS yeah. teacher, um, we're very isolated, it, even in our own school. Right, I'm the only culinary arts teacher here. Um, you know, our film and broadcasting teacher is the only one in this building. Um, so it's a way to connect with other teachers across the system, but uh, I found the big piece was connecting with these SAIT and NATE instructors. Um, you know, uh, Red Deer Polytechnic is a, is a fantastic community to, that I've that been introduced in uh, this year. Um, you know, there's folks from Medicine Hat and Lethbridge as well, so it's basically kind of like the, the, real, the real culinary arts folks across the province coming together um to again support supporting student success um, in a in a very highly competitive environment i think most high schools in calgary participate in skills um, but it's it's definitely something that we we want to see continue to grow uh, the cbe does does very well we send a, a big team to provincials every year uh, over 100 students we just get on big three really big buses and, and send yeah. them all up for the week. And there's something like 10,000 students from Edmonton go go visit the, the Expo Center. And it's, it's just, a, it's a lot of fun. Having seen a few kids from rural Alberta, which is where my experience is, attend that event. I know how exciting it is for them. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that I gave you a platform to share for oh, those thanks, that yeah. have never experienced it. <laughs> awesome. So thank you, Rob, for taking time to be here today. And uh, I look forward to sharing your story and the artifacts that you're going to share with us. I want to put in the descriptor of our podcast so that people can click on it and see what Ernest Manning School is up to. It's great, thank you so much. Ensuring success for all students is a moral imperative for all schools, but it takes a highly coordinated framework of structures and processes to maximize the collective capacity of the team. In collaborative response, three foundational components that transform how we respond to the needs of learners, we share an organizational mindset that involves fundamental shifts for schools and districts. Numerous school and district examples, as well as access to a large number of resources, are provided within the text and in the accompanying companion website. Join the growing number of schools using collaborative response to ensure high levels of success for students and staff, stemming from the essential belief that every child deserves a team. Well, it's unfortunate our listeners couldn't be a fly on the wall for that little last part of the conversation after we <laughs> shut yeah. the recording off. <laughs> All good. But it came back to that notion of community, 
and the connection of wellness for the adults in the building connecting to the wellness for the kids in the building, which I thought was kind of a highlight of what Rob was celebrating around the culture that's built with the implementation of collaborative response. Well, and I think, Jen, too, when you think about any one of us, our teaching practice, it's it's integral to who we are, mm -hmm. right? Like it's personal. It's it's not I've got my work over here and then who I am is over here. The, my teaching, my classroom practice, how I interact mm -hmm. with my students and my colleagues, it's deeply personal. So when you get into those collaborative team meetings that Rob was describing and having to describe that to others and having even just the verbal or, or nonverbal nods and affirmations like there's there's a deeper connection that comes when I'm sharing my professional practice that I've worked on and I've honed than just you know we grabbed a coffee mm -hmm. at the at the end of the day like he he spoke of the trust and vulnerability mm -hmm. that's been built within the overall staff team which is so so integral when we talk about truly deep mm -hmm. collaboration that happens in a in an organization well and you know uh even going beyond that though is you know cre creating those environments where we can share practice but sharing challenges yeah and challenging uh experiences that they've had with students and uh and then to hear other people saying yeah i i also I have that, that challenge too, too. Yeah. and it's that confirmation that you know we all are actually uh, experiencing similar things and we can lean on each other to be able to problem solve together but, and it does create that sense of community and trust and um and compassion for each other but that's what rob alluded to is the structures like the formalized structures allow that to be productive mm -hmm. and not just i have this challenge you have this well now let's vent yeah. about it yeah. but we have this challenge okay what could we do purposefully this, right solutions action oriented. oriented actions oriented yeah and so through those structures and processes one of the things that was a highlight for me is how the staff could see themselves and the work they were doing coming back to them right mm -hmm. yeah. that ctm yeah. newsletter from the initial sessions that had the here's the here's the supports that we've identified and they could see where they had contributed to that and then the the second round where he talked about, okay, so here's the issues that we all sort of faced. And now your group can go and focus on the issue that most pertains to them. Again, seeing their vulnerabilities yeah. shared mm -hmm. amongst the entire staff and recognizing they had that in common. But like you said, with the structure now to go and address them. Yeah. And I think, especially in a school of that size, I think the importance of the artifacts become really valuable when he mentions you know we meet two different times each time has eight different teams that's a lot of coordination and mm. conversation that are happening when you can bring that the artifacts that are happening it just shows that yeah we're a large staff team but we're in unison we're we're working together with that one of the things that really stood out to me that i think is a real takeaway for our listeners or possibly a confirmation is that idea of ready fire aim that he yeah. repeated once again we hear this over and over and over but the idea that it's evolved yeah. it hasn't remained static we put it in place and we remained rigid of even though we staff were asking for some shifts or adjustments no we have to stick to this one way how it's evolved and even how Rob was suggesting, as we look at next steps, it's going to continue to evolve. Yeah. Um, and with his lessons learned of, if I had known then what I know now, we probably would have started even earlier because mm -hmm. it was going to evolve. We were never going to get it perfect in the planning stages. But with the input from from the teachers that there were. Oh, yeah. I love the like, feedback cycles they had. Yeah. And just having to be able to, you know, experience this, then tell us how it it went and then let's make some shifts and then tell us how it went and yeah. like it's that cyclical learning and adapting from from that response so if i was going to summarize community and how investing in the human capital in the professional realm has actually enhanced the social capital 
in their school. Yeah, huge. Number two, um, the trust and vulnerability. So just how the structures themselves create a safe space for that to come out. Number three would be ready, fire, aim, because it's going to be an evolution. So you might keep your iterations to yourself till you think it's ready to go, but then you're going to put it out there. It's going to evolve anyways. So start sooner and keep shifting and pivoting as it fits in your context. So a huge thank you to, as I mentioned, when we were in conversation with Rob, I know he's just a spokesperson for a, a larger group and kudos to the Ernest Manning formalized and informal leaders that are really digging into this work. It's, it's fantastic to see the impact it's having for their staff and students. Um, thanks for your willingness to share. Absolutely. Thank you. And like I said, I appreciate the, the way it makes me think about what high school could have been like with my grad class of a thousand <laughs> had some of this been in place. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's a perfect example of the underpinning idea around collaborative response of every child deserves a team. Well, you can't do that one kid at a time when it's a grad class of a thousand, no. but through this, we can build team structures that benefit each and every student, even in a large, large high school such as Ernest Manning. And as well, benefit all of the staff at the same time. Absolutely. For more on collaborative response, visit jigsawlearning.ca or join the JL Insider to receive access to newly added resources and content. Make sure to follow us on social media, subscribe to the podcast and the Jigsaw Learning YouTube channel to access past and upcoming episodes. Join us again for more conversations about establishing, refining, and deepening collaborative response.